Hello and welcome to the Dance Palace. Um, <clears throat> we're here to see something very special and that's the work of Carlos Parada. Um, we're seeing it as a, as a gallery reception. Um, and I'll explain that because it's, uh, it's a change of, of, uh, of things because of our pandemic. Historically, the art committee, which I'm a member of, and Carlos is a member of, has, um, has invited emerging artists or established artists to come to the Dance Palace and use our gallery to have a one month show. And we would do 12 of those a year. When we got into this pandemic, we were unable to bring people here. Um, we closed down the, the Dance Palace to, for safety of the community and, and people to Dance Palace. And our art committee came up with the idea of doing the virtual gallery, something that we'd never done before. And over the course of this last almost year and a half now, um, we've produced uh, almost 15 of these receptions of artists in the community. Uh, and today, uh, I know all of us, all of you out there in the audience and uh, I and Carlos and, and Laurel Ann are going to be thrilled to be able to uh, see Carlos's work. A little background on Carlos. He was born in Puerto Rico <clears throat> and lived there to age 19 when he left for New York after his mom told him to go spread his wings, which is a wonderful phrase given the tens of thousands of wings he went on to capture photographically. In New York, he found a job at a psychiatric hospital where a psychiatric nurse caught his eye and ultimately became his wife, Rebecca. The two of them moved to Puerto Rico from New York where they had their first child and uh, Carlos uh, completed his BA in psychology. He also worked at the local PX where he got his first serious camera and began his relationship with photography. The Paradas moved back to New York where Carlos completed a master's in education and at some point won a local photo contest and began to spend more time with his camera. Another move occurred when they <clears throat> um, were moving to Southern California uh, where Rebecca had come from. And this move soon shaped both his professional and his photographic life as the family camped in state and national parks while crossing the country. Carlos noticed the life of rangers and that it really appealed to him. So in Southern California, he sought and found a job as a ranger with California State Parks when they got there. At some point, he heard from other rangers about the giant redwoods in Northern California and packed up his family for a trip to see him. Returning to his job, he pursued a transfer to redwood country, first to Samuel P. Taylor Park, and then a couple of years later to our local Tamales State Park, where, <clears throat> pardon me, he worked until retirement. He and his camera were quite active throughout these years, yet Carlos, the photographer artist, didn't become real to him until he was retired. And two events shaped, him, shaped his view of himself as an artist. First, as an emerging artist, Carlos showed his images at the Dance Palace. He was one of those artist that got his first show uh, at the Dance Palace when we were asking people to take the risk to become an artist in, in the public's eyes. And he did that. And um, that began to really grow his artistic image of himself at the same time. And then during an extremely difficult year of loss and illness, he and his family supported his four-year-old grandson through the ordeals of chemotherapy. Several days a week, Carlos would escape to nature, the place he calls church, where photography provided him recharge time, comfort, 
and a very different focus. And his artist self image bloomed and he saw himself as an artist. Please join Carlos Parada and see his artworks of the natural world. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rich. I, uh, I'm a blushing a little bit. I mean, that was such a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, introduction. I, I, I wasn't quite sure if you were talking about me, but that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Anyway, so uh, let me uh, share the screen here and uh, we're going to come to, uh, let's see how we're going to do this here. Uh, here we go. Here we go. All right. So can you see the one large image? Good. Good. All right. So basically, um, what I'm going to share today with, is some of my latest adventures and interesting experiences in the field and finish the program with some of my wildlife portraits. This particular image of Tuli Elk at sunset was taken near the Drake's Beach entrance. Tuli elk were reintroduced to the seizure by the Department of Fish and Wildlife in 1978. So um, I had chosen a comfortable place to sit with a good background to help me blend in. I then stopped moving to not attract any attention. And half an hour later, the great blue heron showed up. I got some images shooting in quiet mode to not disturb him. Suddenly I noticed this coyote coming over the sand dune, moving in my direction. He slowly worked his way down the dune. He got close to the water and into the river otter's trail. He stopped and looked around for a bit and started heading towards the reeds and brush. Oh, sorry. I could not see him any longer as when he got behind the reeds. I stayed in my spot and 10 minutes went by, observing and not moving. All of a sudden, a river otter family of seven appeared from stage right. They played and frolicked for a while. It's a thrill to watch the little guys playing with each other, just like kids do. Suddenly something got the attention of everybody. They all stopped and they were all looking towards the left, including me. That is when I noticed it was the coyote I had seen a while earlier. The otters moved in the direction of the coyote and then got back in the water. All of a sudden, now comes the coyote from stage left, carrying the carcass of a pelican that I can safely assume was the river otter's kill. The coyote worked his way up the dune and in came the ravens wanting a piece of the spoils, a piece of the action. They harassed the coyote for a bit, but it did not bother him much. He decided to continue on his way over the dune to go find a peaceful place to have his lunch. Once more, patience and perseverance paid off. If you choose a spot to sit and wait for long enough, you may be rewarded with the natural circle of life and the interconnectedness and interdependence of all the different players in the ecosystem. 
I chose this image as the portrait shot of this visual story. And since we're speaking about coyotes, I want you to check out their hunting strategy. This coyote found the gopher. Both ears are pointing down and he's getting ready to jump. That leg comes up on one side and there he goes. Off he goes up in the air as high as he can. He's starting to descend. And it looks like the nose is pointing down and is going first. He lands on the snout. All four feet are still in the air. So the whole weight of that is being taken by that nose and face. Uh, it's amazing to me uh, how, uh, how they just actually handle it and it doesn't hurt them that much, I suppose, because that's how they hunt. So here you can see the first leg hit the ground. So here's another recent new experience for me. I was spending some time observing and enjoying this female great horn owl that I visit often and I know quite well. When this unsuspecting juvenile barn owl flew in, and landed not too far from the great horn owl. Great horn owls are at the top of the food pyramid when it comes to owls. Some people call the great horn owl the flying tiger. The barn owl took off after noticing he was next to the great horn owl. And then the great horn owl takes off right after him. The great horn owl grabbed the barn owl by the feet. Fortunately for the barn owl, he was able to pull off his feet from the grasp of the great horn owl and escape. A very disappointed great horn owl swung right back to the tree she was perched on. That young barn owl hopefully learned a lesson. I knew that great horn owls eat barn owls, but I had never seen it much less captured it. That was definitely a first for me. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take you uh, to Moss Landing. Moss Landing is an amazing place to appreciate sea mammals, seabirds, our coast, the, in our coast, because the drop on the depth is very close to shore, allowing us to see humpbacks and many other species of whales less than a mile from shore. Um, a humpback whale bridging is an amazing sight to behold. They call them the ballerinas of the whales. They land on their backs. It's very exhilarating to say the least. Here comes the landing. And if you're up close, you can see the barnacles really well and maybe even get wet. This was the first time I was able to see Rizos dolphins up close. They're not as common when it comes to the dolphin family. This was my better shot of the Rizos dolphin that day the bubbles got to me. I saw sea lions too. Sea lions are distinguished from other seals because of their ears. My favorite marine mammal in that area is the sea otter. They're so wonderful to watch. Again, I want to remind you that I shoot with a 500 millimeter telephoto lens and then crop the image to make it look much closer than what I am. The goal being not to disturb them from stopping their natural behavior and stress them out. I was sitting very low 
and shooting in quiet mode, not moving for a long time as if I was part of that environment. The otter kept on feeding for a good while and I was able to get these shots. Lots of ocean birds and shorebirds occupy this area. This is a common muir a mile out to sea. While on this trip, I had another first time experience. I am accustomed to observing egrets and herons catch fish and immediately turn them around and swallowing them head first. Well, a sculpin is an exception. The snowy egret brought the sculpting to shore to have a hard surface to kill the sculpting before attempting to swallow it. He would drop it to work on him. He would go back and forth from squeezing the sculpting to spearing it with his beak. He made darn sure that sculpin was dead before swallowing it. Sculpin's defense is raising his sharp spines along the center of his back when he's attacked. Imagine if the back spines will be raised while going down the egret's throat. This is not the kind of fish you want to swallow if there are any chance he may have any life left in him. It took the egret about eight minutes before he swallowed it. It was pretty amazing to watch. Now this was a portrait I ended up with as a result of this visual story. Drake's Bay is one of my favorite places in the Point Reyes Peninsula. If you look towards the bottom right, you can see the elephant seal rookery. In the last three years or so, we have been seeing elephant seals at Drake's Beach itself. The colony is expanding. Winter at Drake's Beach is a delight for birders. These are mostly marble godwits, sanderlings, and others. So after three or so years, there, there have been elephant seals occupying the beach in the pupping and breeding season in the winter. This is one of the bulls. They can weigh up to 5,000 pounds. Meet Drake's Beach Alpha Bull from two winters ago. Around May, a lot of the juvenile bulls come into the beach to molt. You can see some of their old skin coming off in most of these young bulls. Every winter, I also take a trip to the Central Valley to uh, enjoy the huge numbers of white fronted geese and sandhill cranes and trumpeter swans and many other birds. The white fronted geese have such beautiful chest marks. If you look closely, they have a white forehead over the beak, hence the name white fronted. These are black necked stilts and they are common in that area. They're common in our area here too. This is a pintail duck. They have a beautiful blue stripe on both sides of the bill, gorgeous gray pattern and pintail feathers in the back. And a pair of shovelers feeding together. The male is on the left, the female is on the right. And uh, you can actually see why they're called shovelers. Look at that that beak. Canada geese were well represented, lots of them in the area and very loud when they fly.
But the sandhill cranes were definitely the most spectacular birds. They always steal the show. They're the largest and loudest of all the wintering birds in the Central Valley. They're known to fly up to 20,000 feet in altitude to cross over mountain ranges in their migrations. I hear that they blush when stressed or disturbed. Their forehead gets redder than it already is. I was very lucky this year. A few good opportunities presented themselves and I took advantage of them like this one. It's really kind of an interesting shot because uh, when I saw it in my computer, the first thing I thought was, well, I guess that the speed that I was shooting in wasn't that good because I see blur in its wing. But then I noticed the actual body of the bird and it is as sharp as can be. And I realized that it really is because of the wide expanse of the wings of the Sandhill crane that the depth of field couldn't let me keep that in, in uh, sharp. It just went blurry because of the depth of field. It was pretty interesting. This family has two juveniles with them. The juvenile has brown in the back of the head and the red color has not developed yet. He's in the center of the photo. I could not avoid taking a shot of one of the many red tail hawks as that golden light of sunset starts coming in. Towards the end of the day, we observed the backhoe clearing a trench followed by many egress feeding on worms and other small creatures from the mud being pulled out by the backhoe. There was a great number of snowy egress congregated in one place. We call that opportunistic feeding. Birds were flying everywhere and we stayed until sunset to enjoy the fly out. This sunset was a great way to end that year, this year's adventure at the Central Valley. So now to some wildlife portraits. This is a burrowing owl standing on a fence post in early morning light. Burrowing owls are not year round residents. They're winter visitors. They are here right now and will leave in a few months. <clears throat> As you probably already know, red tails are the most abundant hawk we have. You can usually get a decent portrait when you get them at the right angle with the sun. Actually, this is the same great horn owl we saw trying to take down the juvenile barn owl at the beginning of the program. It took me a couple of weeks of observation to end up getting this shot. Learning from her behavior, I could actually tell when she was coming up to a particular branch that she uses to perch when she starts the hunting in the evening. I was able to get myself under that branch. I captured this portrait of, uh, at Redwood National and State Parks in Humboldt County. It was out of his range. It was the first great gray owl I have ever seen in my life. It is the largest owl in North America, but you never find them in the coast. They usually are up in the mountains and way north. I got this portrait of a long-tailed weasel here at the seashore. They're very fast and hard to shoot. I refer to this shot as my frame, quote unquote, portrait of a great horn owl fledgling. No pun intended. Three weeks later, I got this shot 
of the same fledgling with his sibling. There were two that were born to this nest this one year to this pair. Acorn woodpecker working on the granary. At first glance, people think that the woodpecker is stashing all the acorns to eat them later. But actually, they will come back much later to eat worms coming out of the acorns as they rot. Now, isn't that pretty cool? Here are two portraits of a bobcat on the hunt captured last year. They have become two of my favorite bobcat shots. Now look at the size of that paw. Recently at Point Reyes Open Studios, I met a very nice gentleman that works as an animator. He had been looking for the right quail for a story he's working on. The title of the story is Mr. Quail. Well, he found it, Meet Mr. Quail. I got this badger portrait recently. North American badgers are mostly nocturnal. They're found from the West Coast all the way to Texas and North all the way to Canada. Every so often, if you're lucky, you get to see one out of his den during the day. Again, this photo was taken with a 500 millimeter telephoto and the frame was highly cropped. So it appears much closer than it was. Now, this is a female American kestrel having a lizard for lunch. <laughs> um, kestrels are pretty amazing. They're actually the smallest of the falcon family. And uh, they, are, they are actually pound for pound, very effective in what they do. And their menu varies very, very much. I mean, they'll eat just about anything that moves. Now, this is a yellow shafted taiga flicker eating a grub. These uh, flickers um, are different from our common flicker, uh, from the red shafted flicker at this end, uh, in terms of the, the tarsal, the marsal that it has, this mark that has under the eye and coming out of the mouth, which is dark, very dark in the, the, in the yellow shafted flicker. The one on the, on the red shafted at the flicker is a red mark, totally bright red, quite different. Ah, portrait of a coyote. Coyotes are fairly abundant in the peninsula in this last 20 years. I, I remember when I got here as a ranger, there were no coyotes in the peninsula. They were on, on the um, mainland side and uh, but then slowly they started coming in and, and uh, now they're quite common. The eyes that you saw on the other coyote, let me go back one here. This is the actual dominant color of coyote's eyes, normally. This one shows you a rare exception. A recessive gene popped up some years ago and now there are a few of these blue-eyed coyotes in the Point Reyes Peninsula. I have photographed at least three or four of them at the seizure. There will probably be more as the family expands. Now that's old blue eyes singing gray songs towards the evening with a chorus of coyotes behind. And I want to finish uh, with this photo because I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation as much as this northern spotted owls pair enjoy each other. I hope you've had a good time and uh, it's been wonderful. And uh, now let's uh, open it up to uh, questions. It was a, a short but sweet kind of show. So um, I'm open for questions and we can all, you know, uh, I don't know if there's a, in the chat, there might be some questions already or however, Laura Lynn and Rich want to do this. Yes. Well, I'll take the first just, question. 
want to <laughs> quickly say that in Spanish so that so we're on the same channel now. Eh, estamos, si alguien tiene preguntas, pueden preguntarnos por el chat. Eh, y eso, ya le paso la palabra a Rich. Go for it. Yeah, I uh, I just lost the person's name, but somebody asked where in the Central Valley you saw the Sandhill Cranes. Okay, so um, I uh, went up 80 and then I made a right at 12 and I went down to Rio Vista. And then after passing a little bit under Rio Vista, I went to Woodbridge Road. I went to three places. I stopped at Woodbridge Road. Then I went to the Cozumas Preserve, which has a very nice boardwalk. Uh, which actually you can be near the ducks and it's really a nice one. And then the last stop, it's always for us uh, every year, is Staten Island Road. Staten Island Road has uh, all this, it's a giant farming community on the both sides. It's a big old, I guess, big agricultural company because it seems like it's one ranch uh, and it goes miles. And um, in there, you see a lot of a lot of activity of birds. It's really quite incredible to just think of the amount of thousands of birds when they actually fly out and take off. It's really impressive. Um, it re reminds me of a, a comet that an archaeologist, uh, uh, Eden Treganza, did many years ago when he was talking about the Miwos and describing them and. One of the things he said that was that the abundance in the land out here was so much that when the birds would fly above your head, they would darken the sky. And the sound sounded like thunder. That's how it sometimes feels when you're actually there. That's what I felt in the in the in the in the evening when when they all started taking off at once and coming in. It was pretty impressive. You, you cannot um, uh, get over what happens to your heart when you are at that point, uh, standing there and listening to this and, and looking up and, and it, the whole sky is full of birds. I hope that we see that forever, years and years. Any other questions? So we do have some questions here in the chat. Um... Nancy Stein is wondering, have you ever considered publishing a book? Eh, si, si ha eh, considerado publicar un libro en algún momento. I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not one of these people that are very much into wanting to get some big things done. I'm not that ambitious. What I want to do is be able to share with my community and, and do my thing in this local place and, no, es una de esas and just, que, just eh, be with them. I, someday maybe I will, but I don't, cosas, I don't, eh, I, that's not really my interest. Eh, what I want to do is be able to go to church and go and spend two or three days a week and, and be in nature and enjoy uh, poder, that, that wildlife that is there it just fills my my heart it, it, um, it fills me up so carlos can you hear me yes i can hear you hi carlos i'm bill killingsworth i'm sarah's dad yes i know i know you i met you <laughs> you in, did you did uh, yeah so my question to you is you have a unique historical perspective and is from your perspective is the point raised Mi national seashore ti es que, in a bueno, better or una worse position than it was say 30 eh, years ago para, when you started eh, and if not what can we do to make it a better si, well eh, that's, parque, that's a long that's a, a long raised, hard question eh, está, it um, is mejor, it, things always change antes. Um, in, in my days, when I got there in the 80s, we had tremendous amounts of cockles and, and clams and, uh, in the bay. I'm using this as an example. Uh, 82, the flood of 82 came in and it covered a lot of those, those beds. And so we actually lost a lot of the resource when it came to the cockles and the and then they slowly have come back. Things go in circles, eh, in cycles, muchos, always in cycles. And same thing with the foxes, and same thing with the, uh, you know, there's times when we have tons of them, and then all of a sudden 
Disteria comes in, kills a bunch of them, and then all of a sudden, then they come back in again. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to save the seashore to start with, because the way things were going, we would have not have had any of this. This would have not been public land, and thank goodness that we were able to save that. Um, is it better or worse? Um, um, I uh, I have seen changes, but I I still can go and and be at peace with a bobcat or with a coyote or with a... So, uh, you know, uh, there will be more and more people. There will be some of those things that will continue. And uh, I don't know how we can control that. Um, the good part is that development is not occurring in that sense. No more development. And that in itself, I think, was the one of the biggest things that occurred. Um, eh, lo bueno es que no van a haber como us. construcciones muy grandes. Eh, yeah, I think you're right. Eso right. That really answers it. Um, I, you know, eso, it's, um, eh, I have nunca. just loved being here. It's been 42 years for me now, and I, uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. No I will not, I'm not going anywhere else. Eh, this is no where I will die. Eh, aquí um, I talked to my wife and I told her where to put the ashes and uh, uh, it's going to be nearby. It's going to be nearby. Yeah. Yeah. Be for my ashes. There you go. There you go. Eh, we're we're in the same wavelength. There. That's right. Ahí en la misma onda. <laughs> Thanks, Carlos. Yeah, gracias, Carlos. Carlos. Hey, Carlos, this is Alex. What? What Hola, animal Carlos, or bird do you most Alex. identify with? Oh, oh, my goodness, that's a real tough one. I think the owl. The owl. Thanks. Wise old owl. Well, yeah, well, I don't know how much about wise, but <laughs> owl, yes. <laughs> so we have lots of questions here in the chat. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, we have lots of comments too. I just want to let you know because of time, I'm not going to ask them all out. I'm not going to say them all out loud, but afterwards I will be sharing all of your comments with Carlos. Um, let's see if I can pull one of these questions up. Um, let's see. Carlos, you are a great storyteller. What is your favorite animal you like to spend time with? Great information and wisdom. I'm kind of I'm trying to get these in order, everyone. But it, there's so many questions that I'm I'm doing the best I can. So thank you for your curiosity. <laughs> Great information and wisdom. Uh, well, you know the the one that many of us like the most is usually the bobcat. But um, I I love the coyotes too, and uh, I really you know I actually love them all. When I go out, I, if I run into a bobcat, I'm in love with a bobcat. If I run into it, if I run into a skunk, I'm happy. I mean, and you know what? If I don't run into anything that day, that's okay too. I love to actually just be out there. It doesn't matter. Um, I, uh, uh, I don't have a one favorite that I get all the time just concentrating on. Um, I just leave it open and, and, you know, it's like anything else. When you go out in life, you really don't know exactly what you're going to run into. And the only thing we can control is how we react to whatever comes at us. So, and the more you plan, the more things can go wrong. <laughs> Um, great answer. <laughs> Let's see. It looks like we've got time for about one more question. If you did not get your question answered today, um, I will be sharing Carlos's contact information. So you might be bombarded with all these questions, um, but they're good ones. So let's see one more. Um, how about your, how about for your grandkids says, uh, Rebecca. <laughs> How about for my grandkids? My grandkids, oh my goodness. Well, it's it's all for them. And I just wish that I could get them more out there. Um, you know, kids have are in their own age and, and they have their own interest and it's really kind of, uh, I haven't done a great job at actually getting them out there with me. Um, in that sense, I, uh, I feel kind of bad about that. I, I, I should do better, but you know what? I've also learned that you can't force children to be what you want them to be. You actually have to allow them to, to do what they 
want to do. And uh, it may not be what you like. It, it may be uh, some other. I don't know what they're going to be. I don't expect them to be rangers. So, um, you know, I, it's, um, let's see what they want to become. I do more by giving them the liberty to, the liberty to grow up and be who they want to be and who they are than by trying to uh, just direct them in a point that they might resist what no quiero you want them to be. A, She's talking about the book. A, a un punto. Give them a chance when they're 20 or 30 Está or 40 to read the book de, del libro. in the photo. Oh, eh, is that what she's you're talking about? You're welcome, you're welcome contexto, eh, Okay, all right, libro, okay. Eh, well, I, que... whoops. All right, um, <laughs> we'll see. Eh, we'll see where that goes. Nietos, eh, but I, I know where si, you're coming si from, libro, Rebecca. Eh, uh, para yeah. Cuando crezcan. yeah, you're right. Pero bueno, eh, yeah. Vamos a ver. Thank you for that context. Sorry, I've been kind of hopping back and forth in this interpretation role. So I think that got lost in the translation. Um, let's see. So someone asked a beautiful question here in the chat that actually brings us into the next part. Um, Dimitri asked, Carlos, do you offer prints of your images for sale? Uh, yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, I sell my stuff. I um, actually, yeah, I just had a, a three day, uh, wonderful, fun three days on the uh, open studios. I really enjoyed the open studios because I get to talk to so many people and we were open for three days and it went really well for all the artists in the community. Um, it was this great combination of things that the, the COVID had been on for a year and a half. So nobody was able to go out that much. Then there was this great weather then um, people were in really great moods and, and buying like crazy. I, uh, yeah, it was uh, for the whole community. We did really well in this open studios. We're having another one in May and, uh, and people can get in touch with me and I, we can talk about it. I, you know, I enjoy more just going and take the photos, to be honest with you. But, you know, uh, every so often, it's always good to have enough money to actually go buy a new lens. So, yeah, I'm not going to say no. It's not something that I that is that I do this. I don't do this for a living. I enjoy more to actually sharing with the nonprofits than uh, than becoming, you know, a, a very well known photographer somewhere. I just I just enjoy West Marin. Leave me right around here. It's okay. Perfectly fine. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carlos. I I want to. I feel like we could stay here for like three more hours <laughs> listening to the animal <laughs> stories um, and answering questions. Um, and I just wanna, I think it's to closing time and, and wanna hand it over to you for kind of any last closing words uh, before we close out. Well, but before I pass it over to Rich, I, I wanna actually um, give my, my real heartfelt thank you to Don Murphy that is here and uh, he was the director of California State Parks many, many, many years ago. And I worked with him in, in, in different times of my career. And, and I am just honored that you are sitting here with us, Don. I really am. Thank you. My pleasure, my friends. Good to see you. Um, I also want to thank everybody that has come out and, uh, and have been, you know, sat here with me and, and enjoyed some of this stuff. Um, I'm always available and if I can be of any help to anybody, just really give me a call or, or, or get in touch with me in an e email and, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not really hard to, to reach. If I may, I, I'd really like to just say thank you for that comment. Um, Carlos, but Carlos was the Quiero consummate ranger and al, represented what rangers are really all about, and that's instilling a sense of wonder uh, and awe in our visitors and uh, connecting them uh, to the world in, in which they live and, and leaving them uh, better for it. it really changes people's lives, and Carlos was, uh, was really very much the embodiment of that. Uh, thank you, my friend, and really enjoyed the, uh, the show. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I, I'll jump in then. Um, 
are you hearing me? Yeah, I am. Bueno, ahí voy a empezar. I'm not on mute. Okay. Um, this was fabulous, Carlos, bueno, and I think the fabuloso, comment about Carlos, you being um, interested in just contributing to the community, the book didn't matter to you, although I think you and Rebecca will probably work on that one, but um, yeah. I think that the, 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 the notion of, of you being uh, a giving person to the community has shown up on all the boards that you've been on um, and lots of other things, and, and I think that that's what this is about. You are a gift, you are, and your work is a gift. Um, so I'm really pleased to have been able to be a part of working with you on this. There was a note I saw that at the time of your retirement related to Don Murphy saying you were, you were a teacher, at the time of your retirement you had uh, taught um, an environmental education to about 17,000 children in the fourth and fifth grade over the course of your work out here. That's another gift. You got kids connected and, um, and we're all proud of you for that. So to all of you out there who, who showed up, the information about how to get a hold of them and, and, and to donate to uh, the Dance Palace, um, how to buy stuff from, from our pictures from Carlos will be uh, sent to you. It's also in the chat. Uh, um, and next month, you're really going to be thrilled with the artists that we have. She's a one-time poet laureate of, uh, of Marin County, and she's also a watercolorist. And she's got a show that will con, um, put together her poetry and watercolors in an, in, in an amazing way. And um, I invite you to come. We'll be announcing that. Or actually, we have announced it. Uh, um, and I hope to see you then. Thanks for being eh, here today. Entonces. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Really enjoyable. Thank you. Bravo. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I need to add. Um, as Rich said, I just wanted to put uh, say thank you to the Dance Palace for making this happen. Um, it's been amazing this last these last. 13 artist receptions that we've been able to offer um, for free and just to be able to see everyone's faces here. And um, if you felt moved tonight um, by this work and by coming together, um, we would appreciate donations. Um, and also there's a beautiful, um, a beautiful virtual gallery that Carlos has up um, on our site and it'll be up for the rest of the month. So please check it out. And if you want to watch this video again or share it with someone, uh, it'll be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So I think that's it. Um, thank you everyone for being here. I hope you have a great night and um, we'll see you next month. The show is going to be on the 13th of January. Um, look out for our e-blast e and everything, but um, just to keep your calendars uh, looking forward to the next artist reception. All right. Buenas Thank noches. You <laughs> Thank you for the series. Thanks, Rich. Take care. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.